Right? I think we're here. It's hard to tell. But we'll see who joins in in a minute. Um, some of you know that we were out of town for a few days. Uh, we're back. And we got back just a couple hours ago. Let's pray while other people come in. And we'll get started. Father, I thank you for the study. I thank you for those who will be coming. I thank you for the technology that allows us to do this. I ask you to be with us. I ask you to guide us through the things you want us to hear and learn. And I ask you to make uh, our awareness of who you are deeper and deeper. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Jennifer. You're number one. You're number one. Hey, it's good to see you. Um, Okay, I'm going to back up a little bit to um, to what we were looking at earlier. We're not going to back up many verses. The the um, Paul has been invited to speak to the at the Areopagus. It's a group of people. It's a, a council of, of philosophers, and so he's been invited to speak to them. They're always looking for something new and juicy to talk about. And he's begun to talk to him about the things that he would have. Hey, uh, Gary um, and Big Mike, um, talk to him about the things that he's been talking about in the marketplace and the other places where he's been teaching about the Lord Jesus. And I believe his technique was to to um, show up somewhere where the Lord would have him show up, build relationships, connect with people. And so he, this is how he starts in, in verse 17. I said, tell us what, we want to know this new doctrine that you have. So in uh, Acts 17, 22, it says, Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus. Remember those, that's a group of people. It's not a building or uh, an open air um, amphitheater or anything. It's people. So he stood in the midst of these philosophers and said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're very religious. For I, as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, him I proclaim to you. And now we're in Acts 17, 24. And, and I'm going to, hey Donna, I'm going to pick up there and, and back up a little bit because I thought, uh, what we talked about last time, as I was ending, I didn't want to. I didn't want to gloss through it real quick. I wanted to um, get everything we can out of this. So, it says God, who made the world and everything in it, since He's Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with human hands. And so, the word "dwell" means He doesn't stay, and He does not dwell. It means He doesn't stay in permanently. Or he's not housed. And permanently in temples made with human hands, made with hands. God made and oversees as its creator all, as, as its owner, all creation. Therefore, he cannot be contained in temples or anything that mere mortals can make. God, in other words, isn't dependent upon having to be present in one building anywhere. Now think about it. Why would God, who is literally at all times, everywhere, need to live in a building made by people when he spoke a word and everything came into existence. And so we talked about this last time. That's why it's ridiculous and anti-biblical to refer to some Christian building in which we gather to worship, and I like doing that. Uh, I'll be in one this Sunday. I was, <clears throat> I'll be in one Saturday to do a memorial service. I'll be in one Sunday to... Um, to speak again in a panel, and I was in one two Sundays ago, um, the same building. You know, so I, I know they exist, but it's not the house of God. And I don't say things like this just because it irks people, and it does, uh, but not to make, not to irk anybody um, that refer to buildings as God's house. I say these things because we're conditioned to believe things that aren't necessarily, necessarily true just because we're used to hearing somebody say them. So we must learn to take every thought captive to Jesus, 2 Corinthians 10, 5 to 6. If, we must learn to do that if we want to honor God and his word properly. 
which means don't add to it and don't take away from God's word. If that doesn't matter to us, though, we can keep on practicing our traditions that don't coincide with God's words or his intentions. And so last time I talked about how I did a phrase search on the term house of God in the Bible. It showed up 84 times. 78 of those showed up in the New Testament, in the Old Testament. That means only only six of the 84 mentions of the term house of God happen in the New uh, Testament. Three of the six references in the New Testament are uttered by Jesus. And that's in Matthew 12, 4, Matthew 12, 4, Mark 2, 26, and Luke 6, 4. And all of these refer to an old covenant building, the temple. Technically, though, the term house of God refers not to the building of the temple, but really to the family of God who met in, in those two buildings, the tabernacle and the temple. So, yes, the house of God was understood by first century believers to be the people of God. And he lived among them. The one Old Testament reference to the term house of God doesn't that doesn't refer to God's people is found in Genesis twenty eight, seventeen, and it's it's when he's talk we're talking about Jacob and Jacob's ladder, and God saw showed him um, heaven in a in a uh, dream. And he said, this is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven in Genesis 28, 17. So in Acts 17, 24, um, Paul speaks this and Luke writes this. <clears throat> God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. So having said all that, it's also true to say that God does dwell in a different kind of house or temple now. And I mentioned that three New Testament verses use the term house of God, but that none of them refer to buildings made with human hands. And last time we read 1 Timothy 3.15, Hebrews 10.21, and 1 Peter 4.17, all referring to the house of God, but that the houses really are the dwelling place of God on the earth and they're not buildings that remain stuck in one place geographically to the to the ground someplace. Sometimes dozens and dozens or even hundreds in one place. We just got back from Houston. Hey Michael, we just got back from Houston and there's hundreds of buildings dedicated to Jesus stuck to the earth and they never move around anyway. Uh, anywhere. In, in these three verses, 1 Timothy 3.15, Hebrews 10.21, and 1 Peter 4.17, the term house of God referred to born-again people who are not stuck to the ground, but bring Jesus wherever they might go. They are, for the, for the saved people that watch this study, they are or the house of God for one functional reason God is alive within our human spirits and this is where we stopped um, last time we met in Romans 8 9 Paul says this but you are not in the flesh but in the spirit since indeed the spirit of God dwells in you and he says now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ he's not his or he's not he doesn't belong to God to Jesus. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Now, now can you imagine what the Corinthians heard knowing that the Jews had a building called the temple and they had all these pagan temples and in, in Corinth, Paul says to Christians, don't you know that you are the temple of God? And he says this to us now as Christians. And that the Spirit of God dwells in you. In 2 Timothy 1.14, he says, That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. And in James 4.5, uh, James says, Do you not think that the scripture says in vain, The Spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? The reality is, is that we are walking, talking temples of God. And we're not made with human hands. We're made by God's hands. 
in, in uh, Hebrews 3, 4 to 6, verse 4 to verse 6, it says this, For every house is built by someone. Now we are the house of God, right? And, and we are walking, talking temples of the Holy Spirit. Um, the writer of Hebrews says, for, for every house is built by someone, but he, with a capital H, he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterwards. But Christ, as a son, over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. This is significant. We carry Jesus into everything we do and experience. So why would I hit this point so hard? When I was a younger Christian, I was sitting in a church service, and it was uh, in a splinter, or another word of saying splinter of the body of Christ, a denomination. And this denomination didn't really believe that the Holy Spirit literally, like the scripture says, dwells within born-again people. And the preacher was speaking, and I saw him skip over verses like Romans 8 and 9. And there's one a few verses later that also mentions an active Holy Spirit indwelling Christians. That group's belief was that the Holy Spirit dwelt inside you to the degree that you could memorize, retain scriptures in your mind. It's not what the words mean. And and so he skipped over the verses as he, as he preached. And I was shocked because this was, generally speaking, a Bible-believing, Bible-worshipping almost group. So after the service, I went to talk to him. Hey, Lynn. I went to talk to him and basically chased him to the parsonage. And I had one simple question. Do you believe or do you not believe that the Holy Spirit of God indwells Christians? That, that he lives inside of us, and he wouldn't answer it. He never would. All he would say is, well, we should talk about that sometime. And I said, great, let's have a conversation sometime. Right now I'm just asking a yes or no question. And the reason that's important was that splinter of the body of Christ, that fragment, that group that doesn't function as one church because it, it identifies in terms of its splinter. Um, that's not the only one that believes this. So there's a number of, of Christian groups that don't really believe that the Holy Spirit of God is within us. And I think we miss, if we believe that, we miss the significance of what Paul is saying to these philosophers. And also we miss what, I think, garden variety, every Christian, regular old Christians, just like you and me, which they were taught when they were discipled, something that is neglected today, that they believed because God wanted them to understand that they were fundamentally different in many ways from how they were before they were born again. We carry Jesus into everything we do and experience. Most of what most of us do is pretty good stuff. Most of what we do honors God. But when we willfully sin, we also take Jesus into everything we do and experience, even the bad stuff. It's humbling. It's something to think about. So Acts 17, 24 to 25, Paul continues, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with man's hands, men's hands, as though he needed anything. Since he, God, gives to all life, breath, and all things. So let's think of all the times we've been guilted into worshiping God. Many of us have been told things like, You owe God your worship. Or God needs your worship. Or has in some way inferred that. In attempts, in attempts to guilt people to make them show up for, for worship events. It's not uncommon in the body of Christ for that. That's one of the reasons for all the advertising that goes on Tuesdays on Facebook and, and many Saturdays on Facebook is to make people feel bad for maybe not showing up uh, at, at an organized, scheduled uh, time of worship. 
God needs your worship. That's what they say. And the reality is, God needs nothing. God doesn't need for us to worship. We need to worship him. And not just through the activities listed on an order of worship brochure handed out most Sundays. Although those order of worship pamphlets are cool and the things on them are good and beautiful to practice. But not just through those activities listed on someone's order of worship. Why not worship God with our lifestyles? The New American Standard Version of the Bible renders Romans 12, 1 like this. He says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. He's talking about something different. Acts, um, Acts 17.24 I hate when my pen doesn't work and I, I'm using it. Um, Acts 17.25 says, Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he, since God, gives to all life, breath, and all things. I have been intrigued with this statement, nor is he worshipped with human hands. It bothered me because as we worship him, we often do things with our hands. We clap. We lift our hands, unless it's forbidden, which I want to say there's a verse in one of the Thessalonian letters that's, that forbids us to forbid others to lift holy hands. But I remember in one splinter that I was a member of, um, someone lifted their hands during worship, and the song leader stopped and said, do you have a question? And it was to shame the person into not lifting holy hands. Um, but we, we do. We clap. We, um, we lift holy hands. We clasp our hands in prayer. We do stuff with our hands, right? I think Paul said this, nor is he worship with men's hands, because worship of the other gods that the Greeks and the Romans were worshiping was nothing but a physical exercise, nothing but something that happened on the earthly plane, whereas true worship of God happens deep inside a person from within the spirit and the soul and then it pours out of our physical bodies in which he has placed us real worship I believe is an internal act first <clears throat> you know many in the body of Christ seem to worship in physical ways only sort of going through the motions and to be sure, many get a lot of spiritual fulfillment doing physical things, and there's nothing wrong with worshiping physically. The, you know, we sing, and we do other stuff. The human hands is a representation of physical things. There's places where people worship and dance. There's people, you know, and I, I love I love that. I, I don't dance and worship. I have uh, when the Holy Spirit grabbed a hold of me, and I really didn't even realize I was doing it. But it's not it's not my natural thing. I guess well, I guess that says something, doesn't it? It's not what I feel wired to do. But it'd probably be good to to be able to let loose like that. Um, but some people sing. They sing in other tongues. They might. There's lots of different ways to do physical things in worship. There's nothing wrong with any of those. The question is. Is the source of our fulfillment coming from outside of us because of the physical acts? Or does it emanate from deep within where God lives in all Christians? And it's something that, that bears mentioning. I, I love a, a big corporate worship service in some form in which many people are singing. And I, I just love, I love vibrant spirit-led worship I really do but I wonder sometimes if how much of what moves me isn't the Holy Spirit of God but it's the physical experience like you know 
like going to a concert, a rock concert, or um, some kind of concert. It, is it is it the the group dynamic from the outside in, or is it something on the inside out? I will say this that that reasoning through all this, praying and asking the Lord to reveal, and speaking. You know, I'll speak or I'll write. And, and, and my my, um, my question was, um, for the Lord, is if you're capable, and I believe God is, of touching us in worship, then why do we need to have a speaker? And I'm talking about why do we need me to be the teacher or be the speaker or be the writer or be the, um, like if I was a musician or a songwriter, why would he need that? And, and I don't think he does. What I think happens is that, um, well, one of the ladies that, that I, I'm close to, her brother is a, is a pastor, and he spoke yesterday, and, and she was there. And she said, did you happen to hear us talk? And I have, I still haven't yet, because I I, we drove today and had a couple of meetings and um, just got home a couple hours before the study. And so I haven't had a chance. She said, it was awesome. And I asked her why, and she hasn't answered me yet. But So hopefully I'll find out sometime this week why she thought it was, and I'll listen to it and see. What I believe happens when when the Lord speaks through somebody, and this could be as like a thousand people in an auditorium, it could be 10 or 15 people in someone's home, it could be two people sitting across the table from one another. It could be turning to someone in line at the store. And one of the guys, a pastor, he did that. He just met somebody and was able to minister to him in a restaurant. The guy was waiting on him. Um, <clears throat> one of the other guys, that pastor, was going to get jewelry and praised. And they wound up locking the place so they can hold hands and pray. And they were worshiping as he directed them back to the Lord. Uh, just led by God to do it. But but when that happens, what, what is the dynamic? And here's what I think it is. If the speaker, and this is how I try to write, this is how I try to teach, this is how I try to speak if I'm standing on a stage someplace um, speaking on behalf of the Lord. If whoever's doing that releases himself to the Holy Spirit and truly wants to be utilized by the Holy Spirit of God, it's literally the Holy Spirit in that person's spirit speaking through the vessel, whoever the person is. Anybody can do this. When that's the case, then the Holy Spirit who dwells within the hearers perks up and responds. The Holy Spirit responds to himself coming from whoever is speaking or writing or playing music or whatever the modality is. And then the person's soul livens up because the Holy Spirit within them basically rises up, we might say, in some parts of the church. But really, it's the Holy Spirit within them responding to himself, the Spirit bearing witness with himself through the souls of yielded speakers or writers or musicians and the hearers or readers of that. That is what I believe happens. That's, that's a form of worship. I believe. Now what about if the person's lost? Everyone who hears this and participates in this um, that's born again used to not be. And how did that person get born again? Well, that happened. And even though the Holy Spirit didn't dwell inside, as one one uh, church father said, there's a Jesus-sized, Jesus-shaped hole in everyone. And when the person responds, that hunger for being born again responds to the Holy Spirit and whoever is ministering to them. However it is, music or a play or whatever it is. And they respond to God, the Holy Spirit, working through the yielded individuals that are presenting the information. That's how this happens. The influence of heaven flowing from one human spirit through a soul, through a body, into another body, another soul, to either bring the Holy Spirit into that person through salvation, or for the person to respond to the Holy Spirit within themselves. 
That's what I believe happens with all this. So the question is, does worship emanate from outside because someone's presenting some kind of emotional experience and the person's emotions, that's really just their soul, so it becomes a soulish response? Or does it provoke the Holy Spirit of God in a person and the, the expression of worship comes from deep within to without? This just could be philosophy, but I really believe it's important for us to meditate on these things so we can participate, so we can be willing participants. In much of our current church culture, a mere emotional experience is often referred to as being spiritual just because it affects us. But I don't think that's what God means. The idea of spirit is a tangible thing. God is spirit, and we are placed by him in an earthly world which is totally encompassed by the spiritual realm. When this spiritual being, God, manifests through us or in a place, some place, we have an encounter with him. And that is a spiritual experience. Or when a demon confronts us, or a clean angel, a good angel, appears. These are spiritual beings. When the Holy Spirit of God convicts a person, that is a spiritual experience. When we experience his joy, his love, his peace, all of fruit of the Spirit flowing out of us, that is also a spiritual experience. I was talking with Michael uh, last night. We had a wonderful time, um, just he and I, hanging out and enjoying life and um, enjoying our long-term relationship, our friendship, and, and our pastoral relationship. And, and we were talking about how he's Skyping someone on another continent and the Holy Spirit affects that other person. And, and, and he just said something was seemingly innocuous, just like in passing, but the guy responds to it. And, and it occurred to me, and I spoke this to Michael, is that I really believe that every human hungers to, have, to be affected by God to somehow um, be addressed by him. There's, there's this part of us that when someone allows God to minister through them, as that comes out of them and the other person, it comes to the person, some people, it's like their souls and their spirits leap in recognition of that. And I, I think that we're built that way. I think we're built to respond to God. And I think the woundedness that Satan puts in human souls is directly related to Satan's desire for us not to respond to God that way. He wants us to live our wounds. He wants us to live the fear or the anxiety or the depression or whatever emotional response to the wounds are. He wants us to live that and not really truly live and live free and alive. And so when someone does something that plucks the strings of our heart, it could be a good thing, perhaps a very good thing. But that doesn't mean just because we have a spike in our emotions that it's necessarily a spiritual experience. I may say a prayer from my flesh, and because it's from my flesh, it won't be a spiritual experience because it came out of my flesh. But when God pours a prayer out of my spirit, that's a whole different thing. That is a spiritual experience. <clears throat> we Christians, we are in a process. We're in a process of ceasing to be mere physical human beings and really becoming live spiritual beings who live temporarily in physical human bodies. So in Acts 20, 20 uh, Five. He says, Nor is God worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life and breath and all things. <clears throat> the idea here, let me, let me get a sip of water. <clears throat> the idea here is that God isn't worshipped with men's hands. 
The word translated as hands actually means grasping. <clears throat> so the words for worshipped with men's hands here has to do with the things people do physically to appease their gods, small g gods. God, Paul knew that the pagans were, in the name of worshipping those gods, really grasping at those gods. In other words, their approach to what they considered to be gods was basically gimme, gimme, gimme. Like beggars do when beggars are desperate. The sobering thing is that those gods grasped at them. Demons need to use people. In Matthew 12, 43 through 45, our Lord says this, teaching about demons. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, and he's talking about his influence, when the, and the influence of an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest, and he finds none. Then he says <coughs> to himself, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, a human soul. He wants that influence back in there. He finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and he takes with him seven of the spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first, so it shall also be with this wicked generation. It's a sobering thing. I mean, he's using he's using symbolic language about a human soul as a house in which demons can live. I personally believe, and we talked about this when demons were cast out of people earlier in Acts, that uh, what's really cast out, the language speaks about being demonized and not demon possessed. And I believe that it's it has to do with with the influence with with, with the, the demon's ability to cause a human to instinctively obey it so that the demon's influence invades. So they're not actually, it's kind of yuck to think of a demon being inside somebody. So I really, I don't, I really don't, not just because it's yucky, I, I think it's the truth, is that when God casts a demon off a person, then he's basically removing that influence from the person and freeing the soul up to just experience freedom without being controlled that way. Demons need to use people so as to inhabit them with their influence. Our God does not need us. He says, nor is he worshipped with the men's hands as though he needed anything. Since he gives to all life and breath and all things. Now Donna is is part of the study. She just posted a meme of a, a woman crying floods of tears. Donna, if you would type in uh, why, if you could, I would appreciate it. Uh, so if it's something that we can add to the study, then this would be more interactive. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he, God, needed anything. Since he gives to all life, to all, life and breath and all things, he gives to us. What does he give according to Paul? He tells us that God gives life, breath, and all things. So God gives life. He gives breath. So he gives life, eternal, spiritual, what's known as Z-O-E, Zoe life. Two words for life in the, in the, um, the New Testament. One of them is Zoe, Z-O-E, and the other one is Bios, B-I-O-S, from which we get biology and biological and all those words. Either it's mere physical life or it's, or it's uh, Zoe. And this is the word, and that word life is Zoe. So he gives eternal eternal Zoe life. He gives breath. And one of God's gifts 
is the ability to breathe air. I'm about to sneeze. <laughs> so I need to get in. Um, God gives the ability to breathe air. I happen to be a person who um, has experienced asthma most of my life. I really try to be able to breathe. And wear a mask and exert myself feels just like the onset of an asthma attack. When's the last time you thank God for giving you air and the ability to breathe it? Donna says she was sad because of the lost allowing multiple demons to enter them. The thing is, is they don't know. That's the thing. Sometimes people, lost people will do stuff and Christians will get all freaked out about it. And to me, they're just being themselves. If we're not born again, the Holy Spirit isn't a part of who we are. And we're at the mercy of Satan and his demons. Um, that's the case for almost everybody walking around because most people are lost. And it's just the way it is. It's sad. But sometimes when people are freaking out, just go, well, they're just being themselves. They are reflecting whatever controls them, whether it be fear or whether it be anxiety or whatever it is. I mean, and some born again people also still allow themselves to um, to have the influence of those demons bothering them because either they were told that that doesn't really happen, so they don't ever address it, or because they think they've arrived, or um, a lot of people actually like the influence of the spirits, uh, unclean spirits in their life because they perceive that it benefits them in some way. But when we get hungry to be free, then we will be. We'll go through whatever it takes. So Paul says God gives all to all Zoe life. He gives eternal spiritual life. He gives to all breath the ability to breathe air. And Paul says that God gives all things. So a man once told me that God had never blessed him. God has never blessed me. That's what he said. Or given him anything. And I asked him, did you have air to breathe today when you woke up? Did you have gravity? He said, of course I did. To which I, I smiled and I replied, God did that. And to whom does God give these things? Paul says God gives these things to all. Think about that. This is this is God. God blesses people who love him. Us, his, his children in Christ. He also blesses with the basics of life and the offer of eternal life while they're still physically alive, those who don't know he exists, those who don't believe in him, he blesses those who mock him, and he even blesses those who hate him. He still makes sure they have hair. He still makes sure that they get the things they need. They're stuck to the earth with gravity. He gives those things. Mike says sometimes because of conditioning, Born again, folks don't know they're letting demons influence. I, I agree with that. God is real. Even if you don't believe in him, he's still giving you air. He's still making sure you stay alive. He's giving you time on the earth. God is real, and God is good. He really does love people. Psalm 103, verse 8, says this. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He is slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. God truly does reserve, uh, deserve our worship and our respect. So, so um, in Acts 17, 26, Paul moves on. He says, And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined the pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. I, I memorized this one in the New American Standard. He's, he's uh, determined 
the times and the boundaries of our habitations. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And I think about it, not all the time, but a lot, often. Because what looks like coincidental meetings, I don't think are coincidental. God orchestrated the possibility that we would connect with people in terms of Paul as we talk about it. So Paul starts out by challenging a doctrine that the Greeks had, that other cultures have, have adopted over the years with devastating results. The Greeks believed in something that anthropologists refer to as environmental determinism or geographic determinism, depending on what definition you use. Now, environmental or geographic determinism goes like this. It is the belief that one's geographical origins are superior to every other place on the earth. And that's fine to believe, but many take this to another dangerous level by further believing that since where they come from is obviously superior, then the people from that place must be superior to all other people. Some people, when they hear this, are going to think about some people. The Greeks are credited with this belief, but really it's common all, over the, all around the world. The Native American tribe Comanche, for instance, referred to themselves as the people. And they considered all the other tribes to be inferior, and therefore they were not people to the Comanche. The Nazis took this to an extreme, considering Germans, Aryans, to be the master race and everyone else to be inferior to them. This is why they felt justified in trying to conquer the entire globe and also in killing over 11 million people from groups such as homosexuals, gypsies, Jews, and other non-Aryans, all of whom they considered to be inferior or in some cases, they consider them to not really be humans at all. The sobering thing about this is that members of Christian subgroups, some denominations and some congregations, even, even happens in styles like church group, house church, or cell groups, often seem to consider themselves to be, to be superior to other Christians because of whatever beliefs and practices characterize their personal splinter of the one true church. There's, there's one church. Well, I'm speaking from Jesus' perspective. God believes there's one church. Man believes there's bajillions of churches. But God believes there's one. And so often other Christians consider themselves to be superior to, to uh, their brothers and sisters in Christ because of whatever beliefs and practices characterize their personal splinter of the one true church. The logic goes something like this. I tell you, if you hear this term, my church, then you know the person doesn't agree with the Lord that the church is his church. My subset. My church is the best. Therefore, those of us who are in my church must be spiritually superior to those who do not have the same understanding about things that we have. That's the logic. In truth, how different is this from the logic that we see in any group who believes in environmental and geographic determinism? It's really the same, and it's bad logic. Every Christian was purchased by Christ, and the same price was paid for all. The birth, the life, the suffering, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. Amazing high price paid for each one of us. My point for this, this little rabbit trail, which I think is a very valuable one, is there are no superior Christians. 
And there really is one church. Despite the fact that we routinely grieve Jesus by not practicing that truth. Now the Greeks and the Comanche and Christians who think they're superior to other Christians and any other groups who believed in and practiced what we now call environmental determinism weren't and aren't Nazis. However, they did believe that they were superior people because of something physical, just like the Nazis did. So Paul says he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. The Greeks were born in Greece, which they considered to be the perfect place on the earth. And that meant that they considered themselves to be superior humans. Paul is speaking to the Greek philosophers who consider themselves to be the cream of the crop among the most what they consider to be the most superior people on the earth. That's who he's talking to. These are like the most superior of the superior in their own minds. And he starts like this. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined the pre-appointed times. Who's doing the pre-appointing? God is. And the boundaries of their dwellings. And, and dwellings is like where they live, basically. Many of us wonder why we're here. Have, have you ever asked that? Why am I here? Why am I on the earth? Why am I alive? Why? I, and, and whenever our now might be, and this verse answers that question. We are where we are geographically, and we are when we are in history, because God has determined it to be so. And it really doesn't matter if we don't believe in him or if we mock him. He still has determined when in history we would be on the earth and where we would be. He says, God, he has made. The term has made means has caused. This speaks to the truth that this was an intelligent design and it didn't just unfold somehow by happenstance as some scientists would have, we believe, have us believe. The word from, he has made from. The word from denotes origin. Although some translate this to mean one race, the term one blood literally means one individual life. That's what it really refers to. And surely this points to there being just one race, the human race. And this, of course, the one blood, the one single individual is a reference, of course, to the very first human, Adam. Paul says that from that one human came every nation. And this word nation doesn't refer to countries as we know them in particular. Rather, it literally means people group. And so he has made from one specific individual every people group of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. That word determined or caused has to do with setting boundaries or limits to mark out something definitely to determine, to appoint, or to constitute. It applies to when in history and where, in, where geographically those people groups were to dwell geographically. Again, this has to do with how intentional God is, and this is very meaningful. I take this to every arena of life. In fact, even if I'm just standing in line somewhere in a store or six feet behind somebody waiting to get into a restaurant, 
I consider that whoever is standing around me is there because God has decided they would be. At the very least, we know he knew, always and forever knew, who we would connect with. It just makes life more special to think about it that way, you know? So, so the Bible talks about how God has assembled the church and has has um, connected us like like um, like uh, bones on uh, ligaments. How how the body, the human body, is put together. He talks about the church being that body where parts are connected. And he talks about it intentionally. And I, I put that verse and this verse together. That means that this is very important to me. I believe that if the Lord arranges for me to connect with someone that's intentional, it is basically an act of worship to recognize that and to give it respect and to consider that the Lord very well might want us to be interacting together. A couple of years ago, Michael Newman, who I pastor, who is, who is in the study tonight, told me that there was a couple of guys that he was watching over as pastor and he wanted um, me to meet him. Now really he was watching over Brent who was watching over um, Jeremiah. And so Michael Newman and I had gone out to eat, had a wonderful night, and then he made some texts and phone calls and both these guys were able to get out. Brent is married and at the time had two little boys and, and um and then Jeremiah is a, a man who's still unmarried. And we met at an IHOP restaurant in Houston on Westheimer, pretty close to downtown Houston. And I think we got there about 11, or you know, maybe 10, and we were there until 1 or 2 in the morning. As I was sitting there, I recognized that the Lord connected us four through, you know, I was connected in, basically grafted into the to the relationships already there. And that it was an important thing because God allowed it. Why? Because God has determined, I predetermined our times and our um, boundaries of our habitation. So, so when I was sitting there, I was aware of the intentionality of God to connect us. Jeremiah is now a Facebook friend. I saw Jeremiah a number of times at Brent's house. Uh, where they would meet. Um, I now watch over. Um, I now watch over Brent's um, uh, soul. I'm his pastor. And we went to visit him this week because um, he's moving and his family's moving. And Friday night, Jeremiah was there and another young man was there too. Jerry. And and um, all of it, all of it to me meant more than just, I'm just spending some time of my life at this guy's house with whoever shows up. I, I really believe that this is significant. And I think that we gloss over these things because we just kind of live sequentially. You know, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this in my parents' house. I um, meet these guys, or I'm an IHOP, and I meet these guys, and we just kind of keep moving. But I, I, I want to challenge anyone viewing this video to really pay attention to who God places in our path. They don't all become pastoral relationships. They don't all become deep relationships. But I believe a lot of times they could, but they don't because we don't respect God's choice to determine our times and our and the boundaries of our habitation. In other words, I believe we've wasted a lot of opportunities to connect with people just because we didn't think about it. I know I, I know I have. And I look back and I look at that. So so this helps us to understand the, the specialness of God connecting us with people. It also 
helps us cope with the people with whom we have to deal all the time, some of which are not that fun to deal with. He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Even the irritating people. You know, God's... I really don't think God ever goes, oh, I didn't even see that coming. I didn't know they would be irritating in Mike's life or, or other Mike's life or Donna's life or, or you know. I, I don't think he just, oh, I didn't see that because he knows all things. Those people, even irritating people, are there because God says so. And he has a reason for this. <laughs> I love this. I just love it how all this falls out. He says, so that, in verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. So I'm going to share a Bible study hint about something that he said that sounds like it's just in passing. And that's where we're going to end for tonight because we almost run out of time. And I know a lot of y'all need to eat your suppers or whatever. Um, he says, so that they should seek the Lord. Bible study him. Anytime you see the word so that, um, it always indicates intent. In other words, when Luke, when Luke writes so that, he is telling us, that God's intent for what he did before the so that was to result in whatever comes after the so that. In this case, so that they should seek the Lord in, in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. In this case, after the so that, it means that God's purpose for us being where we are and when we are there and the purpose for others being where they are and when they were there is that we would seek the Lord. It's nice if it works out to be a business deal or uh, someone blessing one another or the beginning of a work for the Lord, a minister and a ministry event or some people working in cooperation. Those are all nice things to have happen. But the true purpose and the core purpose is that we would seek the Lord Jesus. Why? Because it's the most important thing that can happen to us or to anyone else. That's why. All right. Um, I'm, I'm, um, I, I feel so full. Not in particular because of Bible study, although that's been satisfying for me. But just had a quick little trip to another town. We couldn't see everybody we wanted to see. But we went to Houston and we saw some people. Primarily we were going to see the family that was moving, but we saw some other people. And uh, just love being around people that got us connected. And I feel full. On the way home, we saw one of my ministry's board members, who's also our accountant, and his wife, and we spent time together. And we enjoyed the time together. And then we were able to get home in time for me to take a little nap so I could be fresh and so I could teach and not be distracted by anything. I hope this was a good Bible study for you. I hope that it kicks off some things in you, some things to meditate about, because we covered some ground. If you have any questions about anything, feel free to Facebook message me or email me. Uh, so that we can we can deal with them. Um, I'm open to being questioned, to being shown that I'm wrong about something, or to see more. And if you give me something that's more, most likely will show up in the Bible study somehow, you know, because this is eventually going to be an e-book and then a print-on-demand book. So, hey, Robert, didn't even know you were there. I can't see who joins whenever this is here. So anytime anybody joins, if you just say hi, I don't even know who's coming, you know, because the new way that that um, Facebook does it now, it's as live producer, you don't see joins. So I don't know. So thank you, Robert. Um, let's pray, and then we'll be done. 
I, I also, and then, well, before we pray, um, if, if you have any kind of, if you like to read, uh, let me do this. This isn't working the way I want it to. There. If you would like to look at some of the things that I've written, hey, Melissa, if you'd like to look at things that I've written, um, there's probably 250 articles there. If you are interested in, in some of these um, videos that we do when I download this and upload it to YouTube when that happens, then you can go to that link, either of those two links, and you can get right to them. Um, the last thing that I taught from the pulpit is, I think the article that pops up now, it's the first article on the list. So um, it's good to see you guys in here. Didn't even know you were here. Um, because of, of how um, Facebook's improvement with the live producer, um, it just doesn't show joints. So thank you for letting me know you're in here. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for the study. I thank you for those who take time out of their life to be a part of it. I thank you for those who can't watch it because of technical issues or because the internet doesn't work right, um, that are going to listen to it or view it on on YouTube later or on Facebook uh, later. I want to go to my, my um, page on Facebook. I thank you. Um, for the technology. I thank you for those who come. I thank you for those who care about God's Word and want to study it. I thank you for the ones that trust me to teach it. I ask you to bless them, Father. Bless all of us. Bless our loved ones. I ask you to bless people. Well, like we talked about today, thank you that you give to all life, Zoe, life available to all. Um, and those of us who are Christians have take, partaken of that. I thank you that you give us breath and that you give us all things and that those things go to even people who hate you, hate the idea of God, hate um, and mock you, that you still have patience with them, you love them, and you can provide them the basics of life because you are God and you are the real thing. And I praise you for these things and I thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. I will see you next time if the Lord is willing. Bye-bye. I love you all.